It's time to talk Kansas City Chiefs football on the Our Lads Football Network for the OFN today. And coming back for more, Charles uh, Charles Goldman. How's it going, Charles? Uh, I, I assuming you you liked it the first time. Yeah, I uh, I certainly had a good time. Thanks for uh, thanks for having me back. You got it. So uh, appreciate it. Uh, did a great job informing us on on what to expect. And a matter of fact. Uh, I was just going over uh, the the information that we had last time to prepare for the draft, and the information I put in the draft review, uh, the draft preview guide, and it really came out pretty pretty good. I mean, pretty much as we expected. Yeah. Uh, the top four needs being offensive line, edge, wide receiver, defensive line, and that's pretty much went right down the board couple of edge rushers starting with the top pick so there were no big surprises based on what we talked about and um and and then of course uh also uh the fact that there was some movement just before the draft that we didn't talk about or didn't get an opportunity of course to talk about uh and then we could talk about right now as well because uh before we get into the draft talk uh some of the moves that they made uh, and the biggest one being Donovan Smith. So, yeah. cause we, everybody thought, all right, was Taylor going to move over to the left side? Uh, just like his predecessor. Well, maybe, maybe not. It looks like that's going to be the direction, but no, they signed Donovan Smith. He goes to left tackle. Taylor stays at right tackle. And then there were a few other moves as well, including Richie James was signed, uh, they re-signed Jarek McKinnon, but that was the big one, Donovan Smith. That had to be a, a huge get and a sigh of relief for uh, for Andy Reid and definitely uh, for Patrick Mahomes. Yeah, and, and that one came kind of uh, at a time where, you know, I feel like the the that that was that was I think after the draft. That was like right right after they kind of finished everything up there and got some undrafted free agents signed, and I, I think it was one of those things for them where. With Donovan Smith, they see this guy who's out there who has all this experience at left tackle. Mind you, no one on their roster really has NFL experience at left tackle. I mean, Jawan Taylor had a couple of snaps uh, playing left tackle at, at Jacksonville the last year, but they were like for like heavy sets where they had, you know, an extra lineman in there. So he wasn't really playing left tackle. Um, so I, I feel like the Chiefs are kind of, um, you know, covering their bases here. Now you've got a guy who's got like, you know, <laughs> several seasons under his belt playing left tackle. Yes. Uh, playing it at a high level in an offense that's had success. Um, obviously he's not coming off of a great year. He had probably one of his worst seasons last year, but he was dealing with injuries. He had an elbow injury, then he had an ankle injury. Um, so he wasn't 100%. I think that the Chiefs and I think that Donovan Smith is banking on his ability to be able to kind of bounce back and, you know, have a better season. Um, and, you know, he's betting on himself in that way that, you know, one year deal, he can hit the market again and potentially have, you know, a, a big left tackle contract that when guys of that caliber hit the, the <laughs> market, true. they're expected to have. Right. Yes. So um, it, it it'll pay off for him to perform well. And it'll pay off for the Chiefs if he performs well. Now, I do think there still is some like wiggle room and flexibility for things to pan out differently. You know, maybe he comes in and he has some struggles and he's not, you know, uh, you know, he's a shadow of the former player that he was. And, you know, maybe the Chiefs do go forward with that plan with Jawan Taylor and end up, you know, changing their mind, saying, hey, this guy's our our uh our left tackle now. And, okay. you know, maybe, maybe it could be a rookie like, um, like Wanya Morris, who could be, you know, it, maybe he's a guy who pushes for that right tackle spot. And then you're, you're forced. You're like, okay, well maybe we need to move, uh, Juwan to the left side just to, you know, to have that. And then, you know, maybe you have the flexibility to say to, to, uh, Donovan Smith, Hey, look, you know, you came in, you competed, you didn't win out the job and now you're going to have a chance to, to be the main guy off the bench and, you know, we'll, we'll see if that's, you know, something that, you know, obviously those types of conversations are tough for guys and might could cause problems. You never know. But um, I, I think there is some, some room and flexibility for things to, to work out differently. Um, I don't, I don't think it's set in stone. I do think ideally they would like Smith to be on the left and, uh, and Taylor to be on the right though. Yeah. 
and, and those are all problems that the Chiefs would love to have. Right. Uh, yeah. Um, and, you know, we might as well start with Morris. So Morris, uh, third round, and to me, especially looking over at the scouting report, and by the way, I know you can't see me, but the audience <laughs> can. Uh, this is the Our Lads Draft Guide. So this is perfect opportunity right now to order this, and we'll have a link in the description area of how to order it because you'll know – uh, all the players that the Chiefs signed and you'll be able to draft it and you'll be able to go right in here and match that with the information. The only player that's not in here with the scouting report is the kid from Stephen F. Austin, who we'll talk about in a little bit. Uh, but Morris in the guide, uh, you look at it and, and it kind of looks like uh, this is the kind of guy you want as worst case scenario, a swing tackle. Yeah. A guy with experience at both right tackle and left tackle. That's Probably again, best case scenario. I'm sure that's what the Chiefs want. They want Smith to succeed. They want Taylor at right tackle, and then Morris is the swing tackle at least for this season. Right, and, and I think yeah, I think that would be the the ideal situation um, for Kansas City. I mean, obviously, it, Chiefs fans have kind of skewed expectations on the offensive line because of how like great Creed Humphrey and Trey Smith were in their first years. Yeah, right. Yeah, uh, um, but I, that's just never. That that was an aberration. It's never yeah. been like the reality of the uh, of the NFL to have these offensive linemen come in and immediately, you know, be these uh, big time contributors. I, I very well think that Juan Morris could be the future at either tackle position sure. in Kansas City, but I do think he he's going to need some time to to kind of develop and um, and to work in this system before you know you can really plug him in there. But um, I. I I think it was a great get for Kansas city, uh, you know, in the third round, uh, it's hard to be mad at that value, you know, looking specifically at the tackle position. I think Kansas city was targeting someone in, at the bottom of round one, uh, maybe the other Oklahoma offensive tackle, oh. his teammate, Anton Harrison. Okay. I think maybe that was a guy they were looking to move up and get. Um, but when that didn't happen, they kind of had to pivot, uh, with their draft stat strategy and their plan. And, you know, I mean, by the way, it, and, I, and I, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but would, yeah, does that mean, though, if they would have made the move that they would not have signed Donovan Smith? I, I imagine so. I imagine okay. so. If, if, if that's the type of move they made, I think, you know, um, they, they would have made it with the expectation that he would come in and play left tackle yes. okay. and that and that um, that Taylor would stay on the on the right side. And, I, you know, I mean, it. It could have been a great move if it had happened, but uh, unfortunately it takes two to tango. I know they tried to call and speak with the Cowboys and move up, and the Cowboys thought they were moving up for the guy that they ended up drafting, the Mozzie Smith out of Michigan, um, and, and they didn't want to move back. So okay. uh, unfortunately couldn't 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 get up to to get who we think was probably Anton Harrison, um, and you know. Uh, but they still ended up with a, a good player that we know they like. We know they wanted a local kid in the first round in Felix uh, in the UK Ozama. Uh, let's talk about because you mentioned how the, the fans might be getting spoiled with what's going on with that offensive line. And so I, I want to talk about how they might have gotten spoiled with the defensive backfield last year with the two picks from this year. So they add Connor in round four. And Jones in round seven, uh, and 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 it's interesting because uh, Jones, our lads had Jones rated pretty closely to Connor. Yeah. Uh, this was um, I, I'm I'm sure this is probably talked about whether or not uh, you know the Chiefs chose Connor a little bit earlier than most people would have expected, um, but after the way that Beach has uh, built. This this team, uh, excuse, uh, yeah, um, Veach has built this team along with Reed. Nobody's gonna, or at least I wouldn't, debate Veach on what he does during the NFL draft at this point. Right. <laughs> so, um, but anyway, Connor uh, listed as a safety in the Arlads guide, uh, but they list him as a corner when they drafted him. I know he's got, you know, extreme uh, ability on special teams, which should also be very important because I know the special teams wasn't on par like they would normally like it to be. Same thing uh, with Nick Jones is a very good special teamer. So you got to believe that that's a, a definitely part of it. But Connor is, is a versatile player. So really he's one of these guys that's going to fit 
anywhere. And when you talk about both of those players, especially Connor, since he was the early guy, what did they say? What did you get a, a, about what the gist of what it was about him that they liked him so much to pick him up in round four? Well, the funny thing is everyone's like, oh, man, they took him too high in round four. The Chiefs were actually considering taking him in round three wow. where, where they took Wanya Morris. OK, um, so they really like this player. Um, I, I know that Steve Spagnuolo and both Dave, him and Dave Tobe um, really, really like the player. Um, he's going to be a, a four-phase special teams guy. He can play basically any spot in the defensive secondary. I, I don't know that I'd play him at like outside corner, but he can play nickel. He can play strong safety in the box. He can play free safety. Um, you, you can really just play him anywhere, plug him in. You know, if you want him, you know, covering tight ends, he can cover tight ends. You want him, you know, big slot receivers, he can do that as well. Um, he, he's a strong athlete. Obviously, he's coming from a school that has a great reputation of, um, you know, of working uh, with NFL defensive backs or, or producing NFL defensive backs, I should say. And, um, you know, he, he's he's someone that that, you know, the, the Chiefs like having these versatile pieces in their secondary guys that can move around so they can disguise different things and do yep. different things. Um yeah, I feel like this is a guy that can kind of come in and fill that Tyron Matthew type role that that they had, um, you know, when when Matthew was there, but they didn't really have a guy like that last year. Okay, um, they've had some versatility uh, with you know a guy like Legarius Sneed, but they haven't really had you know they like these um, these these big nickel packages or, or packages that they can use, um, you know, Buffalo nickel package with with the multiple safeties, three or four safeties in there. Um, Spags loves those. So right. it, that's going to be something that I think it, it's going to give him more flexibility um, to be able to call those packages, to, to get a guy like Connor on the field. Uh, and, and I think he's going to contribute quite a bit uh, as a rookie uh, in that secondary. And then, you know, uh, moving on to, to Nick Jones, I mean, we've already seen a rookie minicamp, you know, he, he, he was there for a day and he made a crazy, uh, you know, interception. Um, and it was just a fantastic play. You know, usually you see it like, you know, guys running around shorts at rookie mini camp, they make a play or sure. something like, eh. but this was like, you know, uh, falling to the ground, knocks a pass up and, you know, catches it as he's falling <laughs> to the ground. Like it was a really, really athletic, impressive play. Um, yeah, he's got really good ball skills, especially yeah. for a player that's only started one year. Well, and I, I think that, you know, he, I believe he was injured at one point, uh, you know, Ball State. So I, I think that the Chiefs see him as someone who, you know, maybe if he had more consistent play there, wasn't wasn't dealing with the injury. Maybe this is a guy that is going, you know, at the top of, of day three instead of the bottom of day three. Okay. Um, and, you know, usually with those later round picks, um, you know, they're talking to a lot of different guys, you know, round six, round seven try and figure out who's going to be available when, you know, when the draft is over. Um, and, you know, sometimes they're going to spend a pick on a guy that maybe they think, okay, we're going to have a harder time signing this yep. guy as an undrafted free agent yep. than, you know, the, than some of these other guys. So some of, some of the times it's strategical. And I, I think this probably was one of those cases where this is a player they liked a lot that they thought with their depth of talent that they have in the secondary, that it was going to be hard to convince him to come to Kansas city. Okay. Um, otherwise. And, you know, I think that's uh, a good reason to go out and spend, spend, you know, a pick on a guy and, you know, his willingness so far to, you know, kind of to get in there and, you know, make plays on defense, but also mix in on special teams. I, I think, uh, I think he'll be someone who's going to challenge for, you know, one of those few remaining roster spots that the Chiefs will have in the secondary this year. Yeah, well, they're going to have a lot of those young guys from last year to this year, so it uh, should be a nice battle at training camp. Uh, now let's talk about the the edge players, including, of course, the first-round pick from Kansas State, the Big 12 Defensive Player of the Year. Uh, is and, and last year picking Carl Laftis. So last two drafts, you know, the Chiefs have done a good job late in the first round of finding guys that have really good pass rush ability and could be around for a long time. And this year they were able to pick up Azuma uh, late in the first round. 
And they also added B.J. Thompson from Stephen F. Austin in round five. So maybe you could uh, give us uh, a little bit more uh, information on what they saw in Thompson. Uh, but Azuma was the big prize, of course. Yeah. Um, so with, you know, with Felix, uh, this player that they the team really liked, um, that, you know, they like his production, they liked his character. Um, obviously, it, it was uh, it was beneficial, the fact that, you know, he's a hometown kid, someone from Kansas City. It's a great story. Um, you know, they certainly love that aspect of it. Um, he's a guy they did a lot of work on ahead of the draft. He told reporters that he had three separate meetings with the Chiefs, um, you know, include, including his visit to, to the team for their local day. Um, and he said he met, you know, with the team for, for several hours on, on that specific occasion. So I, I feel like, you know, this guy, they did a ton, ton of research on, uh, kid they like, um, he, he didn't really get hit the ground running at, at uh, rookie mini camp cause he was dealing with the, I think he had like a thumb injury or something like that. Okay. Um, so we're, we're, we're going to see him probably for the first time when OTAs kick off here next week. And, um, I, I, I think it's going to be interesting. I mean, having two edge rushers, you know, on their rookie deals when you've got, uh, you know, superstar quarterback like Patrick Mahomes, who's taken up a, a you know, a big chunk of your cap space and got a, a veteran, uh, you know, interior guy like Chris Jones, who's being paid at top of market. So when, when you've got those two big contracts, having good, young, productive edge rushers is super valuable. Um, and, and, you know, I think that, Right now, they're they're in a good spot um, at, at that position. You add B.J. Thompson in the fifth round. I think that's a great developmental piece that the that the team uh, is interested in. We know that uh, Joe Cullen, the Chiefs' de- defensive line coach, huge fan. I mean, he told basically told this kid, "We're going to do anything that we can possible to come and get you." So, th- this is a guy they were really high on. Um, and that, you know, he's a little bit different from the prototype that Steve Spagnuolo typically likes. Right. Like he's got the he's got the length and the size, um, but he's he's not quite uh, as filled out. You know, he's about, I think, like 240 something pounds. OK, um, so that's that's a little light for, uh, you know, for for a Steve Spagnuolo edge rusher. Um, I've heard that he's already put on some good weight. So that's that's good news. Just, you know, being uh you know, uh, working with the team and working with their, their strength training department and whatnot, um, just over this brief period of time. So, um, but man, his athleticism, I mean, it pops, like that's something that you expect from, you know, maybe like someone playing like tight end or something, not, not an edge rusher. Um, and, and it translates, I mean, his quickness off the snap, uh, really impressive. Um, something that I, I think, you know, Right now, the Chiefs have a lot of these guys who are, who are powerful. Uh, I think that, you know, um, there, there will be an element of power to uh, Thompson's game, but he's someone that's going to win with a lot more finesse, okay. uh, with quickness, with getting off the snap quickly. So having a, a guy who can win different a different way than most of your guys win, I, I think that's going to be beneficial. And, and I think he's going to push some of these guys, um, you know, at the bottom of the roster. Um, you have Malik Herring, who's an undrafted free agent signing a couple of years ago. You've got Joshua Kando, a former fourth round draft pick, who's done virtually nothing. I think he's appeared in three games in two seasons. So, I mean, you've got these guys who've been taking up some roster spots who yeah. haven't really done a whole lot. And, and you have this guy like who's who's hungry, who the coaching staff really likes, who's coming in. Um, you know, he's someone who's also going to contribute on special teams. He's got uh, some block kicks, some block punts uh, during his career. I think early on in his career at Baylor, um, he, he was playing more special teams than he was at Stephen F. Austin. But that's something that he's looking forward to, you know, kind of picking up again in Kansas City. So, I, I, man, I think it's I think it's exciting. I think uh, I think that group's one of the more exciting position groups uh, here in Kansas City and. You know, last year they had a lot of production there um, when I don't think fans were really expecting it. So I, I think expectations are going to be high and I'm I'm not necessarily sure that, you know, they're going to reach those expectations immediately. There's going to be some growth sure. there, I think, uh, you know, moving on from from a guy like Frank Clark, who who is still out there. And, you know, maybe potentially he comes back. But, you know, we'll we'll kind of see what happens there, how the room rounds out. And whatnot, but it's it's hard not to be excited about the youth movement there. 
All right. Uh, and a couple more uh, players to talk about. First of all, uh, let's stick on defense with Coburn from Texas, the round six pickup. And mm -hmm. this was something we talked about that uh, at some point, now they didn't get a guy early, but that's okay. There wasn't really a lot of standout interior defensive linemen in this year's draft. So if you're going to pick one, this is about the area that you'd want to. Right. But the fact that they were able to get Coburn, it's the exact opposite of Connor. Because Coburn, see, it's interesting. If the team would have picked Coburn in the fourth round and Connor in the sixth, I think most people would have been, okay, that, that, that makes a lot of sense. But I think people thought Connor, well, that seemed like a little bit of a reach, but Coburn was a bargain because right. uh, Coburn had a grade as early as a third round. And so the Chiefs were able to get him in round six, really big guy, a lot of starting experience. But at this point, pretty much a one-trick pony. You know, he's, uh, fr from what I've seen and heard, he's pretty much going to just be, you know, a simple run-stuffing defensive tackle. And that's okay when you have Chris Jones beside you. Yeah, you know, I think last year he had actually some good pressure numbers and uh, sack production and whatnot. Um, I don't think it's his, like, bread and butter, but I don't think it's one of the things where, like, he, he can't do it. Um, I, th I think it's just one of those things where you're going to be happy with whatever production you get out of him in that department. Um, yeah. And, That'll and, be a bonus. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And you know, I I think um, you know, the the thing that probably dropped him down in the draft a little bit is consistency. He had games where he looked just absolutely dominant at Texas, and then he had games where where he was nowhere to be found. Where you know he was kind of looked like just another guy. So I think you know, working with Joe Cullen, working with Steve Spagnuolo and Andy Reid, um, that's going to help him kind of bring that level of consistency up and. Um, he, I mean, it, just a great guy. He seems really excited about, uh, you know, playing next to Chris Jones and I'm sure any defensive <laughs> yeah. lineman is. Yes. Um, but, but I think, you know, he has that skill set. you know, whereas Derek Noddy, who, who they have kind of in that true run stopping role, um, whereas he's, you know, really that, that type of guy who's going to take on doubles and yeah. probably, you know, not do a whole lot in the stat sheet. I, I do think that, you know, um, when maybe you're a little bit more um you're you're not so convinced that that it's going to be a, pa a running down it might be a passing down right you might you might be more um uh eager to put coburn in there than you would naughty and he's a cheaper you know kind of replacement anyway if they do want to move right. on from naughty uh, uh this is this is what you do this is why you have to hit in the draft uh right. And maybe that's a, that, that's that's what's going to happen after the season. But for this season, uh, they got a couple of big dudes there, uh, and we'll see exactly how Coburn uh, develops. And, uh, and then, of course, if they need to, they could move on from Naughty. Okay, so we'll we'll uh, wrap up with uh, Rasheed Rice, and he was just talking about how you know Coburn could really benefit from the coaching, and the same thing with Rice. He picked a perfect spot to be uh, drafted. Because with Andy Reid and that offense, uh, th there's some uh, some things like the route running and, and, and like that that he really has to improve upon. But there's other things like contact balance. Uh, you know, there's, there's a lot to like about what he brings to the table. Three years of being the man, the number one guy, really took off and even developed a little bit of a downfield threat this year. Uh, so you put him in this uh, offense, of course, with Patrick Mahomes and a few of the other young receivers, and uh, the, and it's uh, it's just you were talking about it's exciting with the edge rushers. I got to believe it's also going to be pretty exciting for the fans to keep an eye on these young wide receivers as well, like Rice. Yeah, uh, the Rice is interesting. I um, I wasn't super high on him coming out. I I watched him pretty closely at the Senior Bowl, um, and you know. He 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 has struggles in man coverage um, when when he's matched up one on one like he I, I have concerns there. However, I, I do think that he's a player who can get involved in the offense a little bit more quickly than maybe Sky Moore did last season. Um, I think if you look at him as just like a direct one to one replacement for like Juju Smith Schuster, that's not the right way no, no. to look at him. Um, I think he's going to do some of the same things uh, eventually within the offense. I mean, obviously he's got, you know, a uh, good size and, and what have you. He can make some of those, uh, those catches across the middle of the field. But what, 
what I kept hearing from, you know, from Brett Veach, from from Andy Reid, they both kind of commented and said, you know, when he has the ball in his hands, he almost moves like a running back. Well, yeah, I think that they're going to look to get him involved early on on some of these design touches that, you know, they used to have for Nicole Hardman or they okay. used to even have for for Tyreek Hill back in the day. You know, some of these wider screener, uh, wide receiver screens, some of these bubble screens, these um, orbit motion type of plays, um, you know, end arounds, what what have you, like all these all these different things where, you know, um, you're not necessarily relying on a guy to, you know, go out there and get open one on one, but you're getting the ball in his hands and you're giving him an opportunity to make a play. I think that the way they envision his skill set right now, that he's going to be someone that that they can use in that capacity uh, and that they can kind of bring up through the other stuff, you know, as they go. So, you know, you know expand his role out as the season goes on. But, yeah, I wouldn't be shocked to see him get a lot of those types of touches. Um, and, and you see a guy more like like Sky Moore take uh, take up that that Juju Smith-Schuster role and, you know, playing a lot of s- slots out of snap and what have you next season. And, of course, they brought back Justin Watson. And then they also signed Richie James. So their their depth looks a little bit better, especially with another year for Tony, another year for Moore, right. having a second-round pick in Rice to go along with a second-round pick last year and Moore. Uh, what you said, yeah, maybe they don't have that number one guy, but you never know because these guys are young, and any, especially Tony and Moore have uh, been around for a little bit. What's the... Right now, if you had to guess, who do you think has the the leg up? Or if you had a bet, you had, you're drafting in a dynasty league, and you had to pick. I think we lost you there. You there, Charles? Charles? No, oh, we lost Charles. Hopefully, we'll get Charles back. Let me. I'm going to hang up. This way, Charles will call right back. So anyway, this is a question that I think is really cool for fantasy football fans out there that might want to know the answer to, because we are actually starting a dynasty league this year with our partners at Draft Sharks. So we're going to be getting into that in the next few weeks, actually, as far as programming and videos. So stay tuned for that. It should be a lot of fun. And uh, these are the types of questions that, uh, I'm looking forward to getting the answers to. Uh, so let me go ahead and, and uh, ask that question again as Charles is back with us. So Charles, uh, we're, we're, there you are. So Charles, <laughs> uh, Dynasty League fans, if you are putting your Dynasty League together and you had to decide which wide receiver to take, which one would it be between Tony Moore and Rice? Oh man, that's a tough one. I, I think that that the ceiling uh, for Tony is pretty high. Like, I, I think, you know, as far as guys who could be that, that number one receiver as soon as this season, I, I think you're probably going to go with Tony. Okay. Um, the, yeah, the, the, he, yeah, the big concern with him isn't his talent. It's just that he hasn't been able to stay on the field with the injury stuff. And, um, I, I think, you know, another year um, in the Chiefs system. I mean, like he played like seven snaps in the Super Bowl <laughs> and he had a touchdown and like the, you know, longest punt return in NFL history in a Super Bowl. So, yeah. like, I mean, the talent is there. He doesn't need a lot. Right. Like he can do he can do a lot with a little. But um, I, I think it's just a, a matter of, you know, finding a way to keep him on the field. And I think. You know, another year in the system, working with um, Rick Burkholder and the training staff, finding out, you know, what what just the right way for him is going forward. I think that will be ideal. And, you know, look, he he hasn't really played with a a quarterback like Patrick Mahomes throughout, you know, his entire career. (laughs) Um, You know, uh, at Florida, he didn't have much of a much of anything to work with. And then, you know, in, in New York, he's playing with Daniel Jones. So I, I think, you know, having a quarterback who can push the ball down the field, that's going to open up a different facet of his game being that, you know, the deep ball hasn't really been, you know, something that, that he's, uh, you know, that he's done much, 
yet. I mean, even last year with Kansas City, they didn't really have him running many nine routes or anything like that. So I think that's something, some the, an expansion in his role that we'll see this uh, this upcoming year. Um, but yeah, the, the talent is certainly there. And um, if I had to rank them, it'd probably be actually just the way way you even said it. It would be Tony Moore and and Rice. Okay, um, that would that would be my ranking for them right now. Now, as I said, it's 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 you know deeper, and you could say there's your six, and that's how we're gonna go. Do you first of all? I don't know if the cap is if, if there's enough money, but is there any scenario at all? where they would either trade for or add a veteran wide receiver? I mean, I think it's it's certainly possible. I, I, I think it'd probably be, you know, something they'd look at more if they had an injury or something in the offseason. Okay. I, I think right now to say that they're out there, you know, actively searching for an addition, I don't think that's the case. Okay. Um, I think they want to see kind of what they have now and develop the guys they have and, you know, I think there's benefit to like going cheaper at the position and not going out and paying a veteran a whole bunch of money there. Um, you know, being that you can build out the roster yep. um, elsewhere, you know, pay this money to, you know, guys on the offensive line, guys on, on uh, the defensive line in the defense. Um, so I, I think there's certainly, um, you know, some benefits there to, uh, to, you know, just going with the, the, the younger uh, receivers and just seeing what they can do. I mean, Patrick Mahomes is your quarterback. It's, yes. It's pretty hard to, uh, you know, it's pretty hard to mess up as, uh, a, yes. as a wideout. So, and when uh, you have, when we got a couple of Super Bowls already, uh, right. you, you can be patient. You can right. develop guys. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I don't think they're, um, you know, super eager to, uh, to have this number one guy that they're going to have to turn around and pay and, and what have you. I think, um, I think they're comfortable with the the group that they have, and if they had to go in the season with with those guys, then that's that's going to be <laughs> that, that'll be it. You okay. Know? But um, I I think you know maybe around the trade deadline we're going to be talking about this more because then you're going to have an idea, right? You're gonna yeah. if you go through the early part of the season, which is you know arguably the easier stretch for Kansas City, and you're having some issues at that position that are causing you problems, costing you games, then maybe you go out and you're just like, okay, Arizona, you're, you know, one in five. Let's, let's make a trade. Right. Absolutely. Or, or okay. Tampa Bay, like you guys haven't figured out the quarterback yeah, spot. Let's, let's send Mike Evans to Kansas city. I think, I think that's more possible than, than them going out and making like a big trade or acquisition okay. um, before the, the season begins. And um, I, I, I would, I would be surprised to see it happen at all, to to be quite honest with you. I, I think the only way it happens is if they have some of those issues, um, you know, and, and guys aren't performing as they expected. A uh, couple of quick things before I let you go, Charles. Uh, if there's a position on the roster uh, that they are either concerned with heading into the season or will be concerned with next offseason, what would that be? Um... Huh, that's uh, an interesting one. I mean, I, I would say interior defensive line is probably still a concern until you get Chris Jones under a long-term contract. He's okay. only got one year left on his deal. You've only got right now, as things currently stand, um, you know, one guy who you drafted who's under contract beyond next season. Um, so Keandre Coburn. I mean, you've got a couple of like, uh, you know, veteran guys that oh, they yeah. signed recently, but they didn't. Been. Yeah, yeah, they didn't really have any, um, you know, uh, undrafted free agents that they signed to those multi-year deals or anything like that, really. So um, you're, you're really looking at, you know, that could be a spot that they might have to really rebuild, um, you know, down the line. And, um, yeah, I think that there's a lot of want and desire on both sides to get a long-term deal done with Chris Jones, but business is business sometimes. Yeah. and. Yeah, he doesn't well, have many years left at a, at an elite <clears throat> level at, at that position, and he knows right. it. Yeah, I think you know a three four year extension is a strong possibility there. I, I think like he's the type of guy who, you know, wants to play in one place, and um, that'll do it. And, and you know that could be you know his riding off into the sunset. You know those four or five years that he has left. All right, and then uh, you mentioned undrafted free agents. How about the undrafted free agent class? 
uh, after this year's draft. Anybody that looked good at camp uh, or just, you know, word of mouth that we should be keeping an eye on. Yeah. Uh, Andy Reed spoke highly of uh, Daenerys Prince, the running back out of Tulsa. He was probably one of the top undrafted free agents they signed. And, you know, the chiefs had even before they, even I should say after they re-signed Jarek McKinnon, they had a need at the running back spot because Isaiah Pacheco is coming off of uh, two injuries that he had off-season surgery on. So, you know, Pacheco played at a really high level. Still probably the expectation is that he is your running back number one. But, you know, this off-season, you're going to want to take it easy with him because, you know, obviously you don't want to have any sort of re-injury issues or um, any sort of aggravations or anything like that. And, uh, you know, seeing that he, you know, only got – I mean, really, he had a split workload last season, um, you know, with with McKinnon and and then Edward Solaire. Um, it, it's got a kind of concern. It concerns me. I don't know how much it concerns the fan base, but it concerns me a little bit when everyone's like, "Okay, just give him the running back one job." Yeah. You know, if if he had a hard time holding up, you know, through what he did last season, what's he going to look like with you know a hundred more carries yes. under his belt? So he's a physical runner, as you know and, and now. It, he he seeks out the contact, yep. and you know, I mean, I love that about him, but sure. it's not it's not um, certainly pertinent to having a long, healthy career. So, um, you and know, and Edward Chalaire too. I mean, will he be on the roster this whole season? I you know I think so, just because it it really doesn't you know benefit them to move on from him. You know, just having a guy who knows the offense sure. can. You know, execute. I mean, he he finished yeah. last season. He I think he had six touchdowns. Uh, you know, even though he finished last season on on IR or inactive or what have you, um, you know, he had the the tied for the third most touchdowns on the team or something like that. So um, he he still has a role within this offense. Um, I just don't think that the coaching staff is uh, is you know playing any illusions on themselves that he's the number one guy anymore. So having, okay. you know, they had four running backs last season. Maybe Daenerys Prince is that guy who, who comes in and is the, the number four. I wouldn't be surprised if they added another veteran there at, at some point just to kind of raise the the bar uh, in terms of competition um, okay. at that spot and, and push some of these guys kind of, you know, who are, who are at the bottom. But, um, yeah, I, I think that the, the running back uh, out of Tulsa is interesting, Prince. Um you know the the pass rusher out of uh, out of Harvard, Truman Jones. Um, he's interesting. They listed him on <laughs> they they you know you know there are always those designations on um, on the depth charts or on the you know the practice list that are interesting. They listed him as like a like I think it was like PSR or something like pass rusher, right? Like that was his designation. He wasn't okay. a defensive end. He wasn't an edge rusher. It was that's weird. Yeah, it, it was uh, it was something unique, and I mean, I think he's kind of like lighter on the lighter end, uh, you know, for what Spagnolo type type likes. He's more, okay. and I think maybe he probably would have been a a better fit elsewhere, maybe as a three four outside linebacker. Um, so I, I think they have him kind of in this like designated pass rush type of role. Okay. Um, is what they're looking at, and uh, I think that's you know a, an interesting thing, something to follow. Okay. Um, they recently signed a Kansas State uh, cornerback, uh, Eco Boyedo, I think is how you pronounce his name. Yes. Okay. Uh, and uh, he's a heck of an athlete, um, made some really nice plays at, uh, at rookie minicamp. Uh, it was there on a tryout basis, and, and he ended up signing with the team. So, I mean, <laughs> when he signed, I was saying to myself, wow, uh, like th this, this could be a, a position group that the team makes some trades, send some guys to, right? Cause, uh, they, they've got just a ton of depth that really two positions, cornerback and linebacker, I feel like are just loaded. Uh, there are a couple, couple undrafted, uh, linebackers, Isaiah Moore out of, uh, NC state, Cam Jones out of Indiana. They both were phenomenal. Um, at, at rookie camp, uh, it's just like, you know, uh, the depth of talent at that position group might might be the most talented position group in Kansas City, the linebacker position. And it's and it's usually, I mean, under Spag's defense, not really a right. big part of what they do. So 
uh, should be. Uh, uh, he, he he's probably loving it that yeah. he has this much depth at that position that he hasn't had or needed before. So uh, interesting. We'll keep an eye out on that. Okay, so uh, that should wrap things up. Uh, we look forward to, t- well, I can't wait to talk to you again in a couple of months because the, the, the next time we talk to you, we'll be talking right, right before the preseason and training camp. And that's when, uh, that's when we can all get back into this thing again. Uh, this, uh, this t- 2023 season. And of course the chiefs and the fans, uh, can uh, enjoy, uh, what it's like once again, uh, as uh, going into the season as defending Super Bowl champs. So At exciting times, exciting times. It must be. <laughs> Uh, I appreciate it, Charles. Again, thanks for your time. Uh, Again, looking forward to talking to you before the season begins. Sounds good.